So I will have some very brief remarks to make before. I know you are all here to listen to the lineup, very the lineup of keynote speakers throughout today and tomorrow and then the graduate symposium. Uh, I'll take a few minutes to welcome everybody and, and you know, thank the organizing committee and just uh, you know, say a few words about the growing impact of materials research in society and how we, where we are and where we have come from and where we are going. And you know, in, in our introductory courses, we start by saying that uh, periods of human civilization are defined by, you can gauge how important materials are uh, by saying that some periods are named as Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, and so on. Because the best engineering materials is what defines the quality of life. It is really what you can do with how you engineer materials and how you use it in various different ways. So if the best material available is stone, then everything is made out of that, and you just cannot uh, do anything more. But over a period of time, how things have improved to the point that now everything can be engineered. Everything is all around us. And you would see that also if you map it with how materials uh, engineering grew at University of Michigan. If you look at the history, the college was founded in 1854. University was founded in 1817, so it's a bicentennial year. And it started about a little over 100 years ago, 1914, is when chemical and metallurgical engineering department was formed. It was one department. Around 1969, they split into two divisions, uh, materials and metallurgical and chemical engineering. In 71, they became two separate departments. Uh, uh, chemical engineering, which still has the same name. Materials engineering in 1971, as the, uh, as the standalone department, was initially called materials and metallurgical engineering. It's only in 1985 that they changed the name to Materials Science and Engineering. And since then it has uh, used that name. And all over the country, what used to be uh, metallurgical engineering departments realized that materials are much broader than just metals. And so they changed the name. And so in universities, you will see Materials Science and Engineering departments. However, the materials research is not confined to uh, a typical MSc department. It's, it's campus-wide. And in fact, it's so broad that if you want to get a sense of how broad it is, I encourage you to, to read this book by uh, Mark Meodownik from University of Central London. It's, and he talks about how you know, the story of materials is really the story of civilization. You can tell he's British from the way the word civilization is spelled. Uh, <clears throat> and he talks about going from Stone Age to Silicon Age as materials are the fundamental building blocks, not just of technology, but of lifestyle and culture. It's really about things that get adopted. So you would use smartphone, and smartphone is materials engineering at one of its best, along with many other engineering. But how people tend to adopt certain kinds of things, and it, it defines the culture of the time period we live in. So this is a, a book that I recommend uh, reading. It's available in English and also in some other languages. It shows the, the impact of materials and this very common book all over. So for students in the audience, that's the homework assignment. If you say, you know, define to me what, uh, you know, given how broad it is, how would you define in, in one sentence? And so all of these different words, the, the community of materials research is so broad that you would, some people relate to one aspect of it, chemistry, materials chemistry, materials physics, you know, ceramics, metallurgy, soft matter, polymers, you know, magnetism, diffraction, microscopy, all of those are part of what's called materials research. So that's why the community is so broad, going all the way from you know, making solar cells to manufacturing to understanding the fundamental physics to the chemistry of how you make those materials. So if you have to write that in one sentence, you would say it's interdisciplinary research, you know, devoted to improving the quality of life on our planet through discovery, design, development, and deployment of advanced engineering materials. So it starts all the way from discovering new forms of matter, going all the way to manufacturing and deployment. And the fact that this can uh, really improve the quality of life, you can assess it in one word. If you were to say, okay, instead of all these words in one sentence, the popular American word for that is dollar. It really translates into you know, economic prosperity. It's not improves the quality of life and things that people use. So if you look around our campus, you'll see what are we doing in that regard. You will see that 
you know, we have made impact in the faculty groups working in different classes of materials. Often materials researchers are known by you know, their expertise in certain phenomena and certain classes of materials. And you can look at it and say you know, there's structural materials, materials under load-bearing applications that are composites and metals and alloys, and that are used in all of these uh, applications that are so relevant and continue to be relevant. And in fact, it's time for more uh, energy efficient materials in those applications, as well as materials that are used for their physical properties, chemical properties, biological properties, that could be semiconductors, ceramics, inorganic, or they could be biological or organic materials, so soft matter, inorganics. And all of these come under materials research, and all of these are, are active in our campus. In fact, these images, most of these are taken from a faculty in the audience who have done research in these areas, and they are important breakthroughs. If you were to go back and take a look at the highest level of impact in science, uh, one way to assess it is through Nobel Prizes. So even though there is no Nobel Prize yet on this campus, but if you look globally in terms of how many Nobel Prizes are given in physics and chemistry, and how many of those are in materials area. So I went back and looked uh, you know, about 20 years or so, 20, 25 years, and picked the ones that are most obvious materials. And this is just, I have two slides, this is just for physics. And you can see from you know, the most recent topological matter, you realize the recognize the name here, Taulas, Michael Taulas dad. This is all about computation of topological matter. Uh, blue LED that makes it possible to have white light. Uh, uh, measurement of quantum phenomena. Graphene, which is a form of material, has become a big field of research to the point that it's like a discipline by itself. 2D transition uh, uh, metal materials, two-dimensional materials. Uh, CCD, giant magneto resistance. Uh, laser spectroscopy, uh, semiconductor heterostructures, superconductors, liquid crystals and polymers, uh, TEM and STM, so we have facilities looking at those. So you will see that these Nobel Prizes in, in different areas are either in given kind of material class, like graphene, or, or semiconductor heterostructures, or in some measurement technique that revolutionizes the field of research, like microscopy, diffraction, or in some computational method, the theory and computation. They are all three different areas. And likewise, if you look at uh, Nobel Prizes in chemistry, you will see that in the last two decades or so, there are some that fall into uh, material classes, uh, such as conductive polymers, buckyballs, or fullerenes, quasi-crystals. In fact, we heard from uh, Dan Schickman right in this room earlier this year. And different techniques of, of doing research, cryo, electron microscopy, fluorescence microscopy, uh, ultra-fast laser spectroscopy, molecular machines, and computational methods that are revolutionizing what we can do now, density functional theory, for example. So all of these are defining the, the global impact, and it's, it's really capturing all those words that I talked about. It's the bridge between going from chemistry to through materials to engineering to, to a, a startup company, or from physics to materials to engineering. So it's a huge global impact. The paradigm that's used to define how materials research is done, it's also going through a change, and we are going to hear uh, developments in that area. Uh, generally, we introduce in our classes this uh, uh, tetrahedron that talks about how we relate structures to processing to properties uh, uh, through uh, these relationships of structure pro processing relationships and processing properties relationship and properties performance relationships. In three simple words, you can say it's all about three M's. It's easy to remember, the three M's, uh, making, measuring, modeling. So that's what materials engineers do, and they fi find the relationship between those uh, properties and, and performance. The way it has been done is through empirical approaches. The most common and most uh, used approach is what's called the Edisonian approach. It certainly works if you have the right intuition and the right patience to keep trying things. And you know, Edison uh, would say that if you try uh, 10,000 things, one of those is going to be a transformative breakthrough. But you must have the right idea, the right intuition to try different things, and eventually it works. But sometimes uh, it can be slow, and sometimes people can give up after a lot of failures. So what's now going through is, is maybe developing a new paradigm, and we'll hear about that in many of the keynote presentations, is how you would design materials through computational uh, modeling. That before you go and try 10,000 different things, how would you go about and accelerate? So the key thing is to accelerate, to find solutions quicker. How you discover new forms of matter and design and deploy materials uh, faster and cheaper than what was possible before. And that's called Materials Genome Initiative.
And many of the, the application areas, so I come from DOE labs and they will talk about even for existing applications, you can do an analysis and see how inefficient they are. So this is an example that some of the DOE Office of Science uh, uh, went through detailed analysis to show that the incandescent light bulb that we are so used to seeing, uh, it all starts with uh, coal somewhere that's mined, then it's burned in some plant to generate electricity, which is then going through all these transmission lines, uh, transformers step up, step down to bring electricity in your house, then you plug in and get electricity. And if you compare the units of energy that are contained in the coal that you start with to all the energy losses that you went through, you are only coming up with 2% efficiency. So you are basically losing all the energy. And this shows that even in existing application, there is need for transformative breakthroughs that are also the basis for some of the Nobel Prizes that I showed you before in solid state lighting and so on. In all of these areas of energy that are so important, that are going to be uh, critical in defining what we can do in 21st century with all the needs uh, and requirements in the society, all of those come down to finding the right materials. In established areas such as nuclear, it's all about finding radiation tolerant materials, to transportation, you know, damage tolerant lightweight materials, to mat materials for batteries that have much higher power and so on. All of these are, and one can take simple examples uh, such as the one shown here. Uh, if you take simple example of, of lightweight metals, uh, you could see how the, the breadth of application from just understanding a, a one class of material. So this is just showing lightweight uh, metals like titanium, aluminum, magnesium. They are used all over. And, and uh, the idea for how you design it is different for different applications. And you could have uh, charts like these showing the broader impact of applications of different classes of materials for all the things that I talked about. And it's, it's branched into many other things that was not there. So 30 years ago or so, you would think of computer companies talking about making computers and they are now talking about how to make new products, it eventually comes down to having the right materials technology. Otherwise, you cannot. And you can, uh, uh, you know, you, you cannot develop these technologies such as uh, Apple Watch without having the right materials. In fact, one of our alum is the director of materials at Apple, and he's a metallurgist by trading because some of the, the critical things came down to finding the right aluminum alloy that was going to be used to make the Apple uh, a Watch. And you see all around in, in university campuses, an example is uh, you often look at MIT as an example, and just last week this was the press release from MIT. Uh, Alan Toff forwarded this to me, and, and I said they just formed a materials institute. They call it Materials Research Lab, and they, they realized they, the growing impact in, in the future of materials discipline that has come from the last 30 years in all of these different areas energy conversion, storage, quantum materials, spintronics, photonics, metals, integrated microsystems, sustainability, solid state ionics, complex oxides, you know, biogels, functional fiber. You can see how broad it is, uh, the impact. All of this comes down to understanding at a core level the fundamentals of how you do those relationships, making, measuring, modeling. So I'll stop at this point with just say last statements about the students. Uh, they will hear from graduate students. We wanted to make sure that uh, uh, we include graduate student uh, presentations, uh, uh, oral presentations, and also uh, poster presentations, because students are the leaders of the future. And if you have not yet uh, uh, looked at this website, you know, bicentennial.umich.edu, I encourage you, this is another homework assignment, to go look at this book that talks about the, uh, the stories of University of Michigan and ask the question, why did they use the words always and forever? always leading forever value that defines the Michigan core values. They could have said sometimes leaders and occasionally valiant, uh, and they could have said leadership is only talked about at annual leadership retreat, but they said no, always. It's a core value, it's not just words, it's core value. And I think students really with those values are the leaders of the future. And this is the time when the society needs those kind of leaders, it's now more than ever not just in technological problems, but also the, the political climate we live in, the socioeconomic, the competition globally. It is really materials engineers with what I call the, the killer instinct. That's what is going to define the leaders of the future. And so I'm going to stop at this point and uh, turn it over back to, to Rachel to continue on with the symposium. I really look forward to interacting with, with all of you. Thank you very much.